Hiya, next batch of viewer requests. Questions that are about me personally, so here we go. Ninetales2000 asks, I'd love to hear about some of your guilty pleasures. Guilty pleasures? Um, for movies, I, I kind of like Batman vs Superman and Suicide Squad despite their flaws. They had a nice energy to them. I, I like the first five Ernest movies, mostly for nostalgia reasons, but they also have a surprisingly creative and well-staged action scenes that surprised me when I revisited them. A construction site working as Indiana Jones Death Trap Temple, or Ernest Goes to Jail with him flying over the walls and sealing with a crazy vacuum cleaner, or a pretty epic fight with a troll on the car rooftop. For what seem to be just stupid low-budget movies about Jim Farney having it out, there's some great action scenes in here. As for video games, a guilty pleasure would be Downhill Domination. Uh, how to describe the game? Imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger on a bicycle falling off a bear-infested mountain. It's part snowboard kids, part road rash, part Tony Hawk. You're racing off a mountain on a bicycle. You can punch opponents off their bikes, make crazy jumps, do stunts, dodge golf carts or bears or naked people in hot springs on the way down. Love the level variation. Utah deserts, Scottish castles and monasteries, Japanese woods and hot springs, volcano in Hawaii. All kinds of good stuff. It's crazy. Characters you play as are stereotypes like Arnold. Okay, this isn't much of a guilty pleasure. Just a, just a game I like but isn't very well known. A more truly guilty pleasure would be True Crime, New York City. An open world game where I like everything except the open world game aspect. The open world part is terrible, glitchy, constantly crashes, taking place in the winter, so New York looks extra brown and gray and miserable looking. Fortunately, most of the game's missions take place indoors, and then the game runs a lot more smooth. I love it for how versatile and impactful the gameplay is, the fighting. Normally in Grand Theft Auto style games, fighting is really boring, grab a gun, aim, shoot, or mash the melee button. Here you can pull off all kinds of moves, throw an object in someone's face to stun them, knock them over with a karate kick, several melee styles, throwing people, arresting people, shooting objects in the stage like making pieces of equipment fall on the bad guys, you can smash someone's face into a car hood or toss them into store shells where you see all the objects falling out, shoot in slow motion to shoot a gun out of their hands. I just love how you can stage an entire cinematic quality action fight if I want to. Jump duck beneath a shotgun blast, throw my police stick to stun a bad guy, disarm them, punch him into a fire behind him and then he panics and runs off a cliff. It's great! There's also Fighting Force 2, kind of same idea. The game can be a bit dull in lots of factory and office locations, but it has great gameplay. Mix between platformer, stealth, and brawler, and all mixed together as one whole. Just like True Crime, it gives you a lot of freedom. You can just run up to an enemy and fight them, or just use the environment against them, kicking them off ledges, or looking for weapons and holding hidden corridors. Lots of options and freedom to take down enemies. I like it. Yoshi Mario 40 says, Could you do a dissected on the closest object on a table nearest to you when you read this comment? Um, okay, that's this uh, Rex Roth Red Custom Handbag. Red Roth is the company my dad works in, makes uh, hydraulic cylinders. He's a security officer there, and, and he occasionally takes a bunch of company-related office supplies home when, he, when the company replaces them all. I had this one laying around, I put it on my computer desk because the pain is starting to peel away beneath my keyboard, and I want to protect the wood a bit before I start stop being lazy and repaint the damn thing again. Sechtenundunder, Sechtenundunder 64. He asks, or she asks, don't know if it's already asked, but favorite meme of 2016. Huh. The one where everyone's frozen and the camera moves between them. Mostly because that's the only 2016 meme I'm even aware of. Oh, and it looks like it takes a lot of effort to do, and memes that take a lot of effort to pull off are always a plus to me. Just a username. With people heavily mocking your drawing skills, do you take pride more in your writing skills over your art skills despite having a good knowledge of how animation should work to engage the audience? Uh, I don't really take pride in anything. I mean, I have no advertisements, not sal selling anything, nothing. Just, I'm just an asshole doing stuff for fun. The only money I make pfft, it would be the Patreon I started so I can hire other artists to draw me instead, to draw for me instead. So not very prideful, quite the opposite. I guess that means that I do have more pride over writing. Zero against pride over drawing, that's minus one. And I don't think I have good knowledge in how animation itself engages the audience. The actual animation is stiff and purely practical. If anything, it's a timing and rhythm that's probably my best skill as an animator. Such as it is. Wintism asks, I'm so impressed at how long you stuck around to make funny videos. What are some of your personal favorites? Favorites of my own work? 
I'm reminded of what Ezio Ferrari said about his preferred Ferrari car. My favorite Ferrari is the next one, or something. Although he probably said it as a clever businessman type, maybe. Uh, usually with my animations, it's like, I love the idea when it's just an idea script. Then I start drawing it, and it's meh. Then when I get near completion before the sound and last details are in the video, I hate it. Then when I finish my new animation, I love it for a brief moment until a couple of days later where I start to slowly hate it again. So in a way, I hate all my old animations. I suppose my animations that keep me the most satisfied for a longer time are the ones that are more rhythm and sound based, like music video stuff and such that have a lot more complicated staging. So the Kingdom Hearts music videos, or possibly the last half of Sonic Adventure in 2 million minutes, that had a lot of complex staging too. That's probably the stuff I like the most. Guardian of Legends. One thing I've always been curious about is how you feel about certain kinds of humor. Dark comedy, trend trenchant humor, puns, and random lol nonsense have all been discussed and poked fun of in your animations, but I guess I really like to see an in-depth analysis about each one, how it works, how to do them well. A humor comedy dissected of sorts. Ooh, that's tough. Talking about humor in general, I prefer approaching it from a very specific angle. Out in the open, there's so many variables and contexts that matter. Really depends on a lot of things. Quick opinion on those. Dark comedy really depends on context. I'm generally in favor of dark humor. Creates some spice, but I do require at least some bit of positivity somewhere. Nothing but misery can be draining. Transient humor? What is that? Looking up. Humor in passing. As in jokes that are funny because they are spur of the moment, but not really funny on their own when you give them any kind of complicate. That is a very fascinating thing, especially extrovert. Extrovert comedians have that. Hilarious when you just talk to them and hang out, always got something to say, always got a quip. But man, let them actually write down their own jokes or make a script, and it's dull. I got quite a few friends like these. It's a brain skill, I suppose. When you want to be funny in a group with people, spontaneous and crazy, you need to think fast and very quickly and, ha and have a quick grasp on what's going on and how to respond. But as a result, the jokes are very shallow and you're not really trained to actually structure complexer jokes or setups. I guess that explains Adam Sandler and such, or Pontaf. They're very funny people to hang out with on the spur of the moment, but actually make them write down a script and it's... Eh. Uh, but yeah, in-depth analysis about these things. I'm sure I'll do a video about humor again at some point, but I would need a specific angle. I, I get overwhelmed when I have to tackle such an open and big topic in one go. Sorry. Hentai boy, how about you finally tell everyone how you got that scar? And by that, I don't mean the cover story you gave the police. We want the truth, Roger. Ah, get off my back already. It's a touchy subject. Look, I, I was just a little curious, okay? Th these guys are always going to dark alleys in our town selling some, some white powder. I just, I just wanted to check it out. But th they, they spotted me and they had some guns. And, and well, I, I was running and I saw an open door, so I rushed into that building that the fox i think they saw me they slowed down so, so i went deeper into the building i ran into it seemed to be some sort of store I, I saw some items on display disney merchandise and then i found this adorable scar figure so i bought it and, and that's how i got my scar look at him isn't he adorable and, and then the fox found me and cut my face open Kiel Kildjur asks, when it comes to your dissected series, what was it that inspired you to create such a thing? Also, what was the first piece of animation that you were exposed to that you can remember? Hmm. I started the dissected series because of my Kingdom Heart parodies. I made Kingdom Hearts parodies and the early ones were crazy and energetic and fast and it was really a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, Kingdom Hearts the series is so complex and weird that you can kind of get lost into it. So studying future games for parodies filled my head with more and more complex thoughts. And then the later Kingdom Hearts parodies became more and more bloated. The humor changed. I had so many thoughts, I worked into them. And those thoughts didn't always translate very well into straight jokes. So characters start to talk more meta and breaking the fourth wall. And, and, and the rhythm and the flow of the, the animation started to get slower and I, I started to hate my own parodies. My, my brain was overflowing with thoughts and it started to ruin the cartoons. So I kind of started writing huge rambling rants in the description of these Kingdom Hearts parodies. Those were basically an early version of uh, Dissected, pretty much. 
Although I did write some rants like that even before that, when I read the Lord of the Rings books for the first time, I also had a weird beta mocking dissected kind of rant about those books too. But yeah, so I needed an outlet for those thoughts to keep my parodies clean, to drain my brain. It was mostly Kingdom Hearts suffering for that, but even Sonic parodies started to become more, well, bloated is the wrong word, but some of <laughs> some of my current parodies are way bigger. But uh, more meta, more jokes about politics behind the games than the characters and story itself, particularly the Rivals of the Last Effort cartoon, the Sonic Rivals 2 parody started to go in that direction. That's when I started to get the, the thoughts that didn't really work in the parody sense apart, start collecting those, and that eventually led to the Dissected series. Even though Kingdom Hearts started it, I got most of that out of my system with the writings, I, I guess, so that's why I didn't make many Dissected videos about those. As for my first animation, well, as a really young kid, everything blurs together. The first animation I have specific memories about actually watching it would be Disney's The Little Mermaid. That was the first time I went to the cinema, so I suppose that's why it left an extra powerful memory. But I was too young to have an actual opinion about the movie. As for the animation that started to inspire the idea that I could be doing these for myself, well, as I said last year, what mostly inspired me to make animations myself was because I happened to run into an animation program by accident and just started to screw around in it. But even years before that, um, seeds were already planted in my head that even no talented losers like me could animate through a cartoon. I have no idea what the name was of that cartoon, but back in the late, late 90s, I went to comedy websites on the internet where you can download a bunch of random commercials and stupid one-minute cartoons for a quick laugh. I didn't really know what they were. I just downloaded a bunch and then just saw what happened. But what inspired me was, <laughs> it was, was actually an animated porn that I accidentally downloaded among those animated. The reason why that inspired me was because despite its crude and simple looks, it was actually setting up an atmosphere and building a world. It starts in an airport, you see suitcases go past the belt, someone picks them up and exits the airport lobby. There's actual staging, atmosphere, establishing shots, a character existing in a world. While most regular or funny cartoons on the internet are just two funny cartoons going up and going blah 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 joke punchline. But here is an actual attempt to set a mood. Mood for smut and hardcore fucking, sure, but still, mood! And I, I suppose that planted the early seeds of the concept, I guess. For making hardcore porn. <laughs> but, well, maybe that's why my older cartoon had more risky stuff. Yeah. Anyway, next question. Frog man. Your top five comedic tropes. I don't know. Oof, hard one. Uh, I like it when puns are carried out visually in a slapstick kind of way. Like, I made a pun about rooftop chases by having literal buildings chase each other once. I, I guess I love this when, when there's immediately a lot of layers on it. A pun, slapstick, logic fallacy, it's like three jokes in one. I like taking a logical fallacy and then making it work within the logic of the story. I do that a lot with the Sonic and Menace parodies, when the more of the story makes little sense, that, that moral going crazy and corrupting the entire story is becoming a running gag. Sonic Rush, weak moral that Blaze is a bad person, that she doesn't let others help her even when she's managing perfectly fine on her own. And the other main character, Sonic, is also always doing things on his own, so... Hey, fine, now to ask Sonic for help regardless of who you are and what skills you have, moral overtakes the entire story until even Dr. Eggman is asking Sonic to help destroy the world for him. Another comedy favorite, I like it when a story sets up a lot of individual jokes that suddenly all come together in some sort of dramatic fashion. The Cornetto trilogy movies have, were always very good at this, especially Hot Fuzz, that starts off as a crazy comedy about cops solving a bunch of stupid small town problems and meeting a bunch of eccentric weirdos, all presented like individual one-off jokes, but then by the finale you get every single running joke Stupid character and punchline returning and morphing with the rest of the movie until every single joke of the entire movie has transformed and combined together into a mega sort of an epic climax. I always like characters that just have an intense joy in being themselves. Dr. Eggman putting his big giant smile everywhere, always a huge grin no matter the context. I guess it's just immensely cathartic to watch characters who are absolutely and shamelessly devoted to themselves and their passions. And finally, the closest you get to me enjoying meta humor. I like it when you take movie or video game characters and make them act on movie or game logic and cliches, either with real world logic horribly clashing with it or with the real world logic utterly removed from it. 
as an example of the first, there's a bit in a drawn together TV show where a video game character is depressed and wants to commit suicide, except he still has 99 extra lives, so he just spends the entire night stabbing himself over and over. Great example of the second is in the first Naked Gun movie where Officer Frank Drabin is trying to get information out of an informant, but he refuses to answer his questions unless he's bribed for money. So the informant is paid, but then in order to answer Drabin's questions, he needs a little clarification of what Drabin exactly needs to know. And then Frank Drabin refuses to tell him. So now the informant needs to bribe the police officer for information to answer that guy's own question. And then they just keep going back and forth, refusing and blocking out information from each other until being bribed even further. Even borrowing money from each other just to keep on going bribing. That's what I really like about the Naked Gun movies. It's like they, they copy a super cliché movie but then remove the reason why story tropes exist that makes sense. So you constantly get characters acting blindly on what movie cliches dictate what they should be doing, but devoid of the logic and humanity behind why it's logical. All right, seems those were all the questions that were about me. So uh, that's one topic finished. Hooray, see you all next video. Bye-bye.